William Bill Dietz is the Director of the Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity at the National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. There's a very comprehensive biography of Bill in your book, in your program, and I'm not going to read that to you. I would point out a couple of things. Uh, first, that Bill Dees is a physician, a pediatrician, as well as holding a PhD in nutritional sciences. And his uh, career has been characterized by the application of good science uh, to public policy as it relates to nutrition. Uh, he has received an extraordinary number of awards and recognition for his work. Uh, a number of these awards are, again, outlined uh, in the material in your program. And he also is the author of a number of important books. Uh, I've always been pleased by the spectrum of writing, because in addition to the pure science that Bill has written, he's done things like a guide to your child's nutrition, which actually may be at least as important as some of the other kinds of science that's going on. Bill Dietz saw the epidemic of obesity coming very early. And he has been an individual who has tried to call to arms the nation in dealing with that epidemic of obesity, but doing it in a reasoned manner, which has allowed him to, to maintain the respect of those on all sides of the issue in terms of how to deal with this challenge. I believe that he is uh, one of the most important science educators uh, in this country, in the sense that he has worked hard to take what we know about nutrition and about obesity to a wide variety of audiences, including a distinguished scientific audience like this, but also lay audiences and many others in terms of trying to deal with what is probably the most critical health issue that we are going to confront over the next several decades. So it's a great privilege and pleasure to introduce to you William Dietz, who's our keynote speaker this morning. Bill. Well, thank you, Ken, for that uh, kind introduction. It really is a, a, a pleasure to be here with you today. And I'm um, extraordinarily impressed by TAMIST and uh, the breadth of expertise and, and interest that this group has had. Uh, it's also my privilege uh, to share with you the perspective that we have on the uh, obesity epidemic. And I've entitled this crisis an opportunity because it really is both. Um, it is the, the chronic disease, in my view, of, of this century. Uh, and that affords us an extraordinary opportunity to um, really change the, the manner in which we live, uh, work, and play. So I want to begin with an overview of what's happening to the prevalence uh, of obesity. Uh, and I want to move from there into what we know and what we think we know uh, about how we should approach this epidemic uh, and focus the last part of the talk on some of the federal initiatives um, that are underway that I think are going to make a difference. Uh, so I want to begin by sharing with you um, the obesity trends that we've collected at CDC uh, in a series of maps derived from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. And uh, these maps were really the result of a serendipitous discussion about how we should demonstrate the data that we are collecting uh, from individuals across the country. This is the largest survey of its kind in the world. It's a telephone-based survey which allows us to uh, assess information on a state-by-state -state basis. And people in this survey are asked about a lot of behaviors, including what their height and weight are, which we've converted to body mass index, which is the commonly used measure for the determination of obesity. And early on, in about 1999, we assembled um, a series of maps based on these data that show the trends in prevalence of obesity. Uh, and as you can see along the bottom, uh, this is a scale of prevalence. Uh, white is no data. And you'll see how this uh, progresses as the, <clears throat> the prevalence changes over time. So these are data from 1992, 94, 96, 98. The first state's greater than 20%, 2000, 2002, 2004, 
we're starting to see greater than 25% 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009, <clears throat> and, um, and now 2010. Uh, Texas has now moved over into uh, the higher prevalence uh, estimates. Now, these are not true estimates of prevalence because they're based on self-report. And people always uh, underestimate their weight and overestimate their height, which uh, flaws this measure. Um, <laughs> The, the true prevalence based on the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which is measured heights and weights and a representative uh, sample of the U.S. population, but not on a state-by-state -state basis, indicate that among adults, the prevalence is about 35 percent. Um, across ethnic groups, it's about the same in um, Mexican-American, African-American, and Caucasian men, but among women, uh, the highest prevalence is in African-American women, about 60 percent. Uh, uh, kind of a medium pre prevalence of 44 percent in Mexican-American women and about 30 percent in uh, Caucasian women. Now, we don't have the same data from children and adolescents on a state-by-state -state basis, but we do have data over time which shows the same dramatic increases as we saw in adults uh, up until 1999-2000 uh, when NHANES became a continuous uh, survey and, and the data are generated for every two years. And most recently, um, the, the data um, have changed, and we appear to be at a plateau with respect to the prevalence of obesity. And you can see here that the prevalence among ethnic groups is somewhat different in children and adolescents than it is in adults. Um, the highest prevalence is in um, non-Hispanic blacks, or sorry, Mexican-American boys, followed um, by non-Hispanic blacks and non-Hispanic whites, in which the prevalence is similar. About 17 percent of children and adolescents uh, are obese, um, and uh, the only uh, there, there's some recent data that are going to be published in JAMA in uh, next week that show that there's a, a slow but continuing rise in non-Hispanic uh, blacks, and there is some debate about whether this is a true plateau uh, or not. But it does seem that the prevalence has, has uh, the, the slope of the prevalence has changed. Uh, among girls, you see much the same pattern that you see in uh, women in terms of ethnic group differences. Um, but in uh, girls across this period, and including the 2009-2010 data, which are forthcoming next week, um, these curves are flat. There is no significant change over this 10-year period. Um, another survey which is also consistent is a, a large survey that we do of low-income children, mostly in, engaged in WIC, uh, which show that the prevalence in these groups is also flat, with the exception of American Indian and Alaskan Natives, and, and the prevalence there um, continues to increase. Um, when we look at the trends over the last 10 years in uh, men, there's a somewhat different pattern. But since 2005, 2006, and in, including up through 2009, 2010, these trends are also flat. Um, as they are in women over the same period of time. Now, the concern about obesity is that virtually every system in the body um, is affected. The major consequences and, and the ones which drive costs the most are those associated with uh, coronary artery disease, um, diabetes uh, is, a, is a major factor, and a variety of cancers are associated uh, with obesity, but virtually every system uh, is affected. So it's no surprise that the costs of this disease uh, and its complications are, uh, have, have risen coincident with the rise in the prevalence of obesity and now account for about 10 percent of the national health care budget. And further, about half of these costs are now paid for by Medicare and Medicaid, <clears throat> which uh, provides an important incentive uh, for the inclusion of obesity treatment in our uh, federal programs. Um, we're, we're already paying the costs of these diseases. Uh, it's uh, important to begin to invest in their prevention. Now, the data that I've just shown you beg the question of why we are at a plateau, and I think it's um, that, that our lessons from tobacco consumption are instructive. Um, oops. Um, these um, data show per capita cigarette consumption uh, beginning in 1900 and um, extending up almost uh, to the year 2000. And notice that there was a pretty constant slope between 1900 and 1950 when the first reports linking um, smoking and cancer appeared. And tobacco use peaked with the Surgeon General's report on smoking and health. Um, 
and then declined when a variety of policy and environmental initiatives began to kick in. Um, but the slope began to change here with the awareness of, of the public um, and really plateaued when that became uh, widespread and, and the federal government pointed a, a spotlight on the adverse effects of tobacco. And what's interesting uh, about this curve is that the initiatives which um, began to reduce per capita cigarette consumption uh, were initiated. These were initiated not at the federal level, but at the state and local level, um, emphasizing the need for a, a, a broad um, approach from the, the bottom up. Um, and the role of the federal government here was really to provide the data that focused on the adverse effects of tobacco and to monitor progress in uh, cigarette consumption. And the other point uh, to be made, which I've uh, already alluded to, is that uh, these were not individual behaviorally oriented approaches that reduce per capita cigarette consumption. They were certainly in play. Um, but these are broad policy initiatives which uh, increased the tax on tobacco, which had an adverse effect on uh, tobacco consumption, um, changed the, began to change the social norms by excluding smokers uh, from public places, and the role of secondhand smoke and its uh, adverse effects uh, had a huge uh, uh, role in this activity. Now, obesity is a much more complicated area. It's not a single product. Uh, there's both uh, physical activity contributions or physical inactivity contributions as well as uh, dietary contributions. And the complexity of this problem is illustrated by this uh, diagram, which I know you can't read, and, and even if you could, you'd be lost in it, um, that was um, uh, produced in the UK by the, the Office of Science. <clears throat> And this shows the complexity of the pathways, both the uh, energy uh, utilizing pathways and, and the dietary pathways that move from uh, the adipocyte all the way out to the food system, which produces the food that fills the adipocyte, uh, and from um, the uh, uncoupling proteins in, in mitochondria uh, <clears throat> and in muscle cells all the way out to the transportation system and all the factors uh, that affect it. So there's room for a lot of work here and, um, and a lot of different pathways. And, um, medical pathways have generally focused on the individual and this individual behavioral balance, whereas the public health arena has focused on these exterior rings in terms of food systems and, and, uh, and, and transportation systems and uh, communication systems, all of which inform um, this debate. So what is it that we need to try to achieve with respect to obesity control? Well, a, a very nice paper um, showed that the average daily energy gap calculated from the weight gain of the pediatric population indicated that for the average adolescent over this time, the weight gained was 10 pounds. This is over uh, this about 18-year, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, 14-year period. Uh, was between 110 and 165 <clears throat> calories per day. Note that it was considerably greater for those uh, teens who went on to become overweight. Um, and this really provides the target for how we should begin to move to prevent uh, obesity. And there's a paper that's going to be published in the next month or so in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine, which suggests that this gap, this energy gap, is about 35 calories for two to five-year-olds. Um, about 150 calories for 6 to 11 year olds and about 175 calories <coughs> for um, adolescents. And, and uh, furthermore, that if we're able to achieve that reduction in calories by uh, between now and uh, on a daily basis between now and 2020, we can reduce the prevalence uh, of obesity down to the 5% level uh, where we started in 1980. Um, but um, and, and there's, some, there's some important potential ways uh, of doing it. These show the, what I would say are, are um, new or, or useful or uh, primary targets. Sugar drinks is the biggest target. On, for the average uh, um, adolescent, that supplies about 250 calories per day. Um, but, and it's true that the Alliance for a Healthier Generation, the Heart Association, the Clinton Foundation, and their negotiations with the American Beverage Association have successfully moved sugar drinks out of schools. Not completely, but substantially. Uh, but even so, that's only 21 to 50 calories of this intake a day that uh, are consumed in schools. 
the healthy weight commitment, which is the agreement um, that about tw the companies that supply 25 percent of the calories in the United States with uh, the Let's Move initiative, uh, and the agreement is to reduce the caloric supply by 1.5 trillion calories um, uh, per day uh, by 2015. Even so, that's about 12 and a half calories per person. A switch of sugared for non-sugared breakfast cereals, that is honey nut uh, Cheerios changing to regular Cheerios or frosted flakes to corn flakes, um, may uh, address uh, anywhere between 8 and 80 calories a day. And even if we're successful at restoring quality physical education to schools, uh, that uh, gets us a net um, increase of about 35 calories a day. Uh, not quite enough to reach this uh, 175 in adolescents, um, but clearly in the range of what would affect uh, this caloric imbalance in younger children. And, and to give you a sense of what um, these targets are, what the opportunities are, this is a, a, uh, these are data that have not yet been published from a large study of feeding infants and toddlers. And, and notice the kind of dietary patterns that this reflects, the absence of fruits and vegetables, uh, the consumption of pre-sweetened cereals and high caloric density snacks, um, the, the uh, extensive consumption of fruit flavored drinks or 10% juices, these would be sugar drinks, uh, and even the switch to lower no fat milk uh, would have a significant health benefit. In addition, a very nice study um, published <coughs> by Darius Mosafarian recently in the New England Journal um, in which they looked at the patterns of weight gain over time in uh, the nurse's health study and the health professional study, identified <clears throat> these foods here, unprocessed meats and processed meats, sugar drinks, fries, and chips, as well as refined grains as contributing to weight gain over time, whereas whole grains, vegetables, and fruits uh, had the opposite effect. And these are the types of, of findings that have led us to focus on these targets for obesity prevention and control. Uh, the only one of these which lends itself to a purely medical approach is pregnancy, where we know that pre-pregnant weight, weight gain during pregnancy, uh, diabetes during pregnancy, and interestingly enough, tobacco use during pregnancy, predispose to early childhood uh, obesity. Uh, but the remainder of these targets uh, are those that lend themselves to policy and environmental changes. Uh, that is, uh, decreasing high energy density foods and increasing low energy density foods like fruits and vegetables. Uh, sugar drinks that I've mentioned, television time is here, um, not and, and listed under energy intake because the effects of television on obesity in children appear to be mediated by the effect of television advertising and food promotion. And the more television a child watches, the more likely they are to consume foods while watching television, and the more likely those foods are to be foods that are advertised on television. But it's equally important to think that um, to, to recognize that no single focus here is going to be successful, that uh, what we're trying to achieve, as was done with tobacco, is a multi-component, multi-sectoral initiative that begins to cross um, many of these uh, areas of the social ecological model. Now, uh, uh, traditional medical interventions focus on the individual, and as I said, those are critically important because um, the policy and, uh, and environmental strategies that we're pursuing are unlikely to affect those with significant obesity, either in the adult or pediatric population. Um, and, but our focus here on communities and institutions are likely to have a much more substantial population impact uh, than those uh, down here, which are important uh, from the medical point of view, but from the population perspective are less likely, uh, are, are less powerful. Now, we're in, a, in an extraordinary time in terms of national initiatives, and <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about all of these. I'm just going to uh, just let you look at this for a moment. Um, but I'm going to focus briefly on Let's Move, which I think has, uh, is certainly the most prominent and visible, and in many respects, the, the most effective in calling national attention to this problem. Uh, I'll, I'll mention uh, that in detail on um, early care and education uh, programs. I'll talk, uh, and I'll talk briefly about uh, community strategies. Now, the the strategies that that we're um, we're putting in place um, are uh, kind of captured by Let's Move, um, and and these are some of the Let's Move initiatives. Uh, the numbers of mayors and and county uh, commissioners um, involved in Let's Move cities and towns has now grown to 800. Um, the areas that we've been very active in, um, and and one of which uh, has been. 
uh, fostered by the Whole Foods markets here in, in Texas is let's move salad bars to schools. Uh, but the area that we've been most uh, intimately involved in is the let's move child care challenge. Um, but I show you these um, not because I think that they're all effective uniformly, they're all voluntary, um, but the net impact of the First Lady's efforts here have been to heighten the visibility of, of this issue and to begin to generate the grassroots support that I think is going to be necessary uh, to transform the perspective on obesity and the efforts around nutrition and physical activity countrywide. Um, as I mentioned, uh, these, uh, we're working in a wide variety of these settings, and I'll just briefly uh, touch on medical settings, uh, child care, and, and communities. Now, with respect to care, it's clear, and you'll hear about this in the panel, that the families or patients' self-management of this problem is key to success. How we align our medical system to address a problem that affects 17% of children and 34% or 35% of adults um, is going to require some significant uh, revision of the way we deliver care. The one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, relationship between provider and patient is not going to suffice, and we have to redesign the way we deliver care. But at the same time, unless that care is augmented by environmental changes and, and strong linkages between medical settings and communities, um, we're, the, the types of changes initiated here are not going to be reinforced uh, or even uh, initiated over here on the environmental side. Now, with respect to child care, uh, it's clear that this is an important target because the amount of uh, the number of children involved in early care and education um, and the amount of time that children are in care, that uh, large numbers of children are in care for 35 or more hours per week. <clears throat> um, and that allows us to change an environment which uh, could be cons uh, much healthier than uh, it currently is for the children engaged in this uh, uh, program and one which allows us to address many of the risk factors that uh, I showed you earlier. And uh, one of the First Ladies' initiatives is the Let's Move Child Care Challenge, a voluntary challenge uh, for child care to meet these standards, which reflect those risk factors which I showed you in the earlier slide. That is, uh, outside play when possible for an hour or two per day. Uh, this is consistent with the new recommendations for physical activity for children. Uh, reductions in screen time, uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, note water access in the absence of sugar drinks, and support for uh, breastfeeding in an ongoing uh, fashion. Um, the other um, program, which uh, has the potential and I think has already begun to transform uh, communities, is um, community transformation grants. This began with um, stimulus funds that uh, brought about $500 million to the CDC for investments in community programs to address uh, nutrition, physical activity, and tobacco, and its successor are community transformation grants funded by the Affordable Care Act. <clears throat> and these programs are now funding 61 communities that uh, reach about 38 percent of the U.S. population, and the principal priorities are tobacco-free living, active living, and healthful eating, and uh, clinical services around blood pressure and, and cholesterol. Uh, and uh, this gives you a sense for the breadth of, uh, of uh, counties and states that are engaged in this program. And the types of strategies that we expect these programs to employ around nutrition <clears throat> and physical activity are uh, include procurement standards like the model procurement standard which we've implemented uh, at HHS and is being extended across the federal government uh, consistent with the dietary guidelines uh, that reduce the availability of sugar, bre sugar sweetened beverages that uh, eliminate fried foods, uh, foods high in sodium and trans fat, and are being adopted increasingly in state and local jurisdictions. Um, providing access to healthy food in underserved communities through the Healthy Food Financing Initiative, uh, uh, an initiative to provide um, retailers with low interest loans to put supermarkets in underserved areas. <clears throat> Supporting breastfeeding through uh, hospital practices that uh, promote breastfeeding and make that the default rather than formula feeding and uh, eliminating food insecurity. And these are paralleled by strategies for active living that include Safe Routes to School, a program that enables children to walk to school 
um, and many children, uh, e even in our uh, urban areas where schools uh, are in close proximity to where children live, are unsafe um, so that walking has not become uh, or has been eliminated as part of a child's everyday activity. Parks and recreational centers are key areas for um, the enhancement of, of physical activity. And one of the most recent developments is this red fields to green fields issue, which um, capitalizes on the unfortunate foreclosure crisis to, um, to, uh, f to raise those houses and create parks. And uh, put those, if you put those parks in proximity to schools, uh, you really affect the triple bottom line of an improved environment uh, you've improved health, and <clears throat> you've also uh, improved the economic um, state of those communities because those, the houses in proximity to those new parks um, are, have uh, an increased um, desirability and therefore improve the tax base. Uh, and finally, programs to uh, increase physical activity like quality physical education or joint use agreements that, use, that make schools available to the community for after hours physical activity. Um, so these <clears throat> are some of the community um, targets that are um, appropriate to begin to change the, um, the way uh, we look at nutrition within communities and the way we think about physical activity in communities. And, and we're often accused of, of uh, really being a, a, a nanny state. But the perspective here is that we can't expect people to make healthy choices unless they're healthy choices to make. And these are efforts to make the healthier choice um, the easier choice. But on the, the most macro um, scale, I really believe that in order to transform uh, this problem, that we really have to begin to conceptualize it as a social movement. And these are elements common to uh, other social movements. One of these is a shared and personalized perception of a threat. And I'm not sure that people perceive obesity as a personalized uh, threat. Uh, obesity is something that is uh, that 350-pound person over there, not the person who is 30 or 40 pounds overweight, which constitutes obesity according to body mass index. As I said, um, I, I think Michelle Obama's efforts have started to foster a grassroots commitment that is being uh, grown by our community transformation grants and our uh, uh, other community programs. Um, but that's really what is going to be required, in, in my view, and, and this um, bottoms-up uh, approach um, will enable a social network that begins to focus on collective actions and begins to share innovation and, and success in much the way um, that tobacco control movement um, began because those communities become local nodes that, that then link to uh, other groups. Um, the concern that I have is that the, um, the funds that have promoted these programs on the national level, that is our uh, community transformation grants, are linked to the Affordable Care Act and the Prevention and Public Health Fund of the, of the Affordable Care Act, which as you know, given the current budget crisis, is under threat. And my concern is that if that act is threatened, or, or particularly if the um, Prevention and Public Health Funds are lopped off, that we will not yet have achieved the momentum necessary um, for sustained action. Um, but that remains to be seen. Uh, there certainly is, has been no uh, other time in my experience where the, the mobilization around this issue and the attention that both the food and physical activity environments have received, uh, this, the, it's really uh, unique in my experience and, and I hope can be sustained. And in closing, I, I'd just like to uh, show you a quote from Howard Coe, the Assistant Secretary for Health, <clears throat> which I think um, captures this issue nicely. He says, the health of the individual is almost inseparable from the health of the larger community. And the health of each community and territory determines the overall health of the nation. And the issue of obesity, spanning as it does, individual to community, encapsulates the importance of our interventions quite nicely. So thank you for this invitation. Uh, I enjoyed my time here, and I think we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah, please uh, come to the mics to ask your questions. Make any difference. My name is Jane, and I'm a sponsor and a guest. There's no ink on my medical degree, so, you know. Uh, I have fought this weight problem all my life, and I am glad to see you talk about the social messages 
Uh, I think it's interesting to see something when one is at home and one is watching something like the Dr. Oz show, whom I guess everybody knows who Dr. Oz is that has a TV or anything. And as the newspaper article the other day says, is there anybody left on this planet that doesn't know that broccoli is better for you than a Big Mac? But on the Big Mac menu, on the dollar menu, there's a wonderful hot and spicy uh, cheese burger or something. So when Dr. Oz is then followed by an ad from McDonald's Wendy's, Jack in the Box, syrup on the pancakes and the waffles from the IHOP. It is a oxymoron, a mixed message or something. Now, I don't think you can get people to stop advertising on TV. However, I think the Surgeon General and his group, Coop, cut out the TV ads for tobacco. Is that right? Um, actually, the, the, the withdrawal of tobacco ads was voluntary on the part of the interest in um, response to the threat of counter-advertising. Oh, and maybe the Brown-Williamson and the lawsuit and a few yeah. things like that. Well, uh, you know, your, your, your question raises a really good point, oh, and that is the whole finished. question of fast foods. I, think. I haven't finished. <laughs> well, why don't you do that, because we don't have a lot of time. Okay. Well, I think you ought to look into how AA works. Although I haven't been to a meeting, I've been thinking of going to a meeting and saying I'm an alcoholic uh, and so I could get a sponsor. But I think that we could mold something like that where people could have, although you talk about self-management, not everybody can do that. And I'm one of those people. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you. You want to comment about AA? Um, well, the, the self-help groups in, in respect to obesity have been some of the more successful groups in, in terms of uh, both commercial and non-commercial strategies. And I think that, that as you point out, sharing uh, common challenges and solutions is a, an important element of successful weight control. But, but it is clear that AA has the advantage that it's complete cessation right. of drinking, which is the outcome. That's what's made the obesity problem right. particularly difficult. Right. And, and the, the analog um, to AA, and, and it doesn't um, promote complete abstinence from uh, food consumption, is Overeaters Anonymous, which is one of the more rigorous groups in that arena. Please. Brief uh, question. Yes, the question I have, or it's a comment and a, and a, and a question really is, um, I definitely think it's, it's hard to argue with social networking and changes in our society, but. The one thing you went over fast, but I think it's very important, and maybe we'll hear more about this in the next session, is this notion of the energy gap that you raised, which was 150 calories or so. And I think that leaves people with the false sense that if they just don't eat the equivalent of half a Snickers bar every day, they won't gain weight. And the reason that's falsity is because our bodies are homeostatic. We have set points. And as we understand our society, we also have to understand our physiology to fight this. It's a bigger problem once obesity is developed, but even genetically we know that there are genes that are monogenic and, and multigenic that contribute to this set point change that's making it hard for people, like possibly our previous questioner, to, to do what they know they need to do. They know they should be eating broccoli, leaving out, but it's not just enough. And we even have uh, physiological responses that make us feel ill if we get below our set point. So, we have to change society, but we can't forget the basic science. Yeah. That, uh, that's quite right. And um, I, because the panel is following me, uh, that follows me, is going to focus, I think, more on treatment than prevention, I've left that. But, but you're quite right. And it, as you know, there was a, a recent piece in the New England Journal that was uh, uh, reprised in the New York Times Magazine exactly. showing counter-regulatory hormones that come into play with weight loss. And the, the, the challenge is this. I think we have a, an effective shot at prevention, particularly in children. The bigger challenge is getting the weight off adults, um, because adults are driving the costs. And, and I think that's a, an area in, in which there has been less investment. There's been a fair amount of research, but in terms of practical strategies, less investment, and it's a key area. I couldn't agree with you more. That one last uh, question. Uh, Bill, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on Mitch's question with a, a different angle. Uh, 
given, given the inability to actually measure dietary intake with any reliability in population studies and instruments, I mean, uh, I, there are data, as you know, in which individuals have measured energy expenditure, measured changes in body composition longitudinally over time, and have produced data that show that the energy gap is actually quite a bit larger than this 150 calories. That is, people are eating a lot more than they think they are. Well, remember that that energy gap is for the mean weight gain over time, not, and, and if you remember the second uh, row in that slide, it's quite substantial in uh, the obese individuals. And, and part of, um, one of the things that's widely um, misunderstood is the, the fact that a lot of the excess energy intake among obese individuals is uh, to sustain obesity at that level. Um, because as you gain weight, you increase your energy requirement, uh, both in terms of your basal requirement, uh, but equally so in terms of the amount of energy that it takes to move. Thank you very much, Bill. Sure.